I literally had 13 businesses before Patricia. So first of all, congratulations on Patricia's 40th anniversary. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Like, it's almost hard to believe that it's just four years. You know. <laughs> Considering the impact you guys have had, what has the journey been like over these past four years? Oh, it has been uh, long. It has been a very long journey. It has been filled with lots of ups and downs. Just the, um, you know, the typical story of entrepreneurship, of trying to past hurdles, especially hurdles in Nigeria. They are, we, have, we have unique hurdles here in Nigeria, but it has been really good, it has been inspiring. We've been able to um, do the most, literally, in such a short time. We've been able to grow from a company of two to 300 plus in Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, Estonia, UK, China. It's been, it's been a wonderful journey. So we are going to come back to your story later, but before that, so yeah. I'm sure you've said this many times, mm -hmm. you may feel tired, but I mean for our audience, can you tell us um, what was the idea behind Patricia, why you started Patricia, what was yeah. the story behind it? So it, first, first off, Patricia started off as, um, I wanted to make extra 30k a month, that was the plan, really, I was not looking for anything I was just trying to just survive, make an extra 30k a month. But before Patricia, right, I had I have been doing all sorts of businesses. I, have, I literally had an entrepreneurial bone from when I was eight years old. I was selling sweets in school, so I, I I've just been doing a lot of things. You know, I went to the university. I bought a bike. The guy ran away with the bike. I sold Indomie and egg. Mishai, my guy, the guy I employed, almost killed somebody. So it was from one drama to another. Like I literally had 13 businesses before Patricia, wow. right? And all of these ones, I mean like on a business scale, not just me selling sweet now, like proper businesses, some went well, but at the end, they all ended in tears, all the 13 of them, you know? So I was, I was not new to the climate or the, you know, to running the business. And, and um, I think in 200 level, I stopped school at some point and just started self-learning, reading books, entrepreneurship. One book that changed my life was, um, there's a very small book, um, The Richest Man in Babylon, packed, super packed. So it, it just basically taught me the fundamentals of life, you know, and um, so Patricia was another idea. I have a journal where I write all my ideas out. No matter how stupid or dumb, I just write all the ideas and I develop them. So Patricia was number 37 on that idea, idea book. And at the time, in 2017, it just seemed like the one that was right to start. At least I felt like I could make 30K faster from Patricia. And that was why I started Patricia. Who gave you that boldness? That, or was it just another one? Oh, this is just me trying the game, another thing. Did you ever imagine that this was going to be the one? Yeah. Never. Impossible. So it was just, it just, was just like, another or more. When did they finish? We need to make some money, oh, okay. bro. Because I was in Lagos now with my brother. Okay. And I'm looking at him, he's looking at me. <laughs> no money on ground. And I, I, so I looked at my idea book thoroughly, you know. And I knew how much I had in my bank account. And every day, the money was just going down. It was first one million, you know, 920, 910, bills are coming. Ah, next thing is 800. And if I don't act fast, I will spend this money in another one month, two months. I would not even know what I spend the money on. So Patricia just looked, at the, looked like the only viable thing that would low cost, right, but possible returns of 30K. So with 30K, I can live on 30K a month comfortably, comfortably. So yeah. So it was it still goes back to the idea, right? So when I had the idea of Patricia, right, I was in my granddad's house. My granddad and my mom, they have this love hate relationship. Right? My mom's name is um my mom's name is Patience. But my granddad never calls her Patience, he calls her Patricia. So they were fighting that day and they and they used to always fight. Like that is that's how they say hello to themselves. 
Because when she sees her, he calls her Patricia, and she's like, oh, this man has come again. Stop calling me Patricia. My name is Patience. And he was like, I will not call you um, Patience. I'll call you Patricia. So they were just going back and forth. And I was like, OK, 37, Patricia. I didn't think much about it. And that was it. So you told the businesses yeah. before them. Which of them was like your favorite? Which one hurt you the most? And what did you learn from it? Well, all of them have lessons, really. I think one of the most remarkable one was the one that taught me that um, jungle rules. Jungle rules. Yes, that's what, I, that's, that's what I call it. Jungle rules. Jungle rules in terms of trust, right? So the first, the first time I experienced jungle rule was when I bought a bike. I gave it to an indigene of Port Harcourt because they, they know the area, they know the terrain, they can get away with stuff. So one month, two months, I actually used my house rent to buy that bike and I was squatting with a friend, my cousin, for one year. So my idea was I'll buy the bike, you know, three, four months later, I'll make enough money, I'll buy another bike, I'll just keep on buying bikes, but you know, I have 10, 15 bikes, I'm blown. That was the plan. So I bought this one bike, gave it to the guy. One week was good, two weeks, was three weeks, fourth week, he just he started missing some days. Before you know, I don't see this guy for one week. And I was like 16 at the time, you know. So I went to meet him in his village. On getting to his village, before I, I said, when I managed to track him down, before I can even say one word, they have given me a very big slap <laughs> on top of my bike. Wow. They, him and his family beat me up wow. and they sent me away. And I was a 16-year-old boy in Port Harcourt, you know. I couldn't call anybody. I didn't even know what to do, literally. So I just counted my loss and just, you know, let that go. Oh, it did. John Gurus. Another time was when, so now I was a little bit more mature now. Maybe I was like 18 at this time. Um, I, I had saved up some money and I wanted to buy a car. Right, so I didn't know what I was thinking, literally, because I've been looking for cars around my city, but they were expensive. Then my friend came up to me and said, said that he has a car in Abba State. He knows somebody wants to sell a car in Abba State for more twenty thousand. Wow. I didn't, I did not know if the car would be good or the car would be bad. It did not just click in my head. All I just knew was that there is a car, and that the car matches my budget of more twenty thousand. So okay, now let's go to Abba. All right. That was how we went to Abba, we went to Umaya, me and this guy. I've never left my city before. It's either Wari, Lagos, or Port Harcourt, right? I went to Umaya by myself with this, my friend. We went to Umaya State to go and buy a car. We got to Umaya, <laughs> it's a funny story. We got to Umaya, we saw the car, right? The car looked okay to me. How much is the car? I want 20,000. All right, where is the buyer? The buyer came, right? The seller, rather, the seller came. Ah, I was looking at the seller, looking at my friend. Looking at the seller, looking at my friend. There was a striking re resemblance between these two guys <laughs> that, I, that I went to buy this car from. Mm. The seller was my friend's father. Mm. Ah, so you want me to buy your father's car? He said, it doesn't matter, and I said, be a car, a car. Okay. Car and a car. I bought the car, one twenty thousand. Now I was to come back to Port Harcourt with the car. It took us two weeks plus to drive that car from Umaya to Port Harcourt. This car cannot drive thirty minutes, and they refused to. As I paid the money, the man switched off his phone, like, and I'm like, call your father now. <laughs> Nobody answered me. Me and my friend, right, we were sleeping in the car, driving the car from Umaya all the way to Port Harcourt. Now, after two weeks plus, right, we finally reached Port Harcourt with this car. And I was excited. Like, I was happy. Like, I felt like, you know, <sighs> finally, so it's time to make money. Mm. So, I've already called all my friends in my lodge. You know, in school, you stay in, in lodges off campus. So they're like 36 rooms and you can, it's just, you know how lodges are, they're just big and just like lined up like this. So we were just there and I called my friends that I'm coming with my car. My friends now went to tell everybody in the lodge 
that because they were asking where, where, where I went to. Mm. So now I'm back with my car. So everybody wants to see my car. So the full lodge now of over 50 people, because there's usually two in a room, three in a room, were just outside waiting to see me and my car. And me, I was, me, I was feeling fly and I was what's up, I've come in my car. I finally drove the car and it was a Volvo. It was in, I don't know if it's 1994 Volvo, but it was, it was a Volvo. On getting there, everybody just started laughing. <laughs> like, it was, you know, this laughter of humiliation. Like, they were laughing for like 30 minutes straight. And I could not understand why they were laughing. Like, in my mind, I, I thought that I just triumphed and got the car, you know. But the, the car was actually a very old car. Like it was a very, I didn't even know that it was that old. So when they were laughing, it then clock, I then clocked that, oh, okay, this, is, this, this could actually be an embarrassing thing. I didn't even know it was embarrassing, you know. So I walked out in shame and just left. So as I was leaving, my caretaker's wife, right, called me and she told me that um, I should not go, I should go back to my car, right? That I should not mind that everybody is laughing at me. She's seen how much effort I've put. I've been trying so many businesses that has failed that one day, one of them will work as long as I keep on trying. And I, that was what I needed to hear at that point. And I literally just went, went back, right, picked up my car and drove off. As I was driving, the car went, went bad again before I left the estate. But still, I just, I just um, learned that lesson about John Gurus, about trusting friends and not allowing shame be the reason why you don't achieve your goals or, or at least even try. You know, because there are many times where I, ha I had a business and the, like, one time I had a popcorn stand in school. Um, my, popcorn stand, my popcorn became the best in the full university because I had the secret ingredients, which is just milk. So usually you put milk when you are making a popcorn, but I put milk when and after. So after, your hands get sticky with popcorn, you can lick your fingers, you have this extra creaminess. But these other guys didn't get it, so everybody started coming to my stand. So I was making so much money from selling popcorn. But the girl I was, that I, I employed, because I had to go to school, started getting fresh, started buying new clothes, started making new hair. And sales were now dropping. But I would pass on my way to school, and I would see the same amount of crowd I usually see. But sales were dropping, and T is always buying new phone. So I didn't want to attack her as, you know, stealing or anything, but I was just trying to understand what was happening. One day I just came to the place, it was locked. Next thing I saw the same girl opposite me, literally opposite me, selling popcorn. All my customers had gone to her because she told them that it is still the same business, but we just moved positions. And it was, I could not believe my eyes, literally. And what do I do at that point? Right. I had to stop going to school right, and started selling my popcorn by myself because I had understood the idea of shame from that past experience. So it didn't matter to me. But still, right, I'm selling my popcorn. My friends will pass. They will take my pictures, put it on a WhatsApp group in school and just start making fun of me and all of that. But it didn't really matter much. It, it, it mattered, right, but it didn't still matter much, you know, because I knew that you're not going to feed me, mm -hmm. right? Just because you're laughing at me, I'll still laugh, I'll come and buy my popcorn. It's free adverts. Mm -hmm. So I understood jungle rules, you know, trust and shame, how to deal with those two things from there. And th those things, seem, they are, when you look at the best entrepreneurs, they think those things are, they are traits they have, uh, not minding what people are saying and stuff like that, laser focus on what you're doing. But then you also seem to have like a very, very, should I say very big sense optimism? Like you are very optimistic, which yeah. is another trait that uh, people like Elon Musk that want to go to Mars and everybody's laughing at them. Yeah. Where did that come from? Is there is there someone in your childhood that gave you that? Uh, were you always like that? Like, and do you agree? Because of who say entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs are born. So who say you can learn it? Do you think which side of that debate are you? On? Well, I think it's a, it's both, right? You are born an entrepreneur, the same way I feel you are born a musician. Right, but uh, so it's like saying um, talent versus gifts, right? Or talent versus hard work, because we are all messy, for example. 
you can argue that Messi is gifted, right? But you can say Ronaldo is hard work, right? It's a, it can, that's an, an argument. But what I would say is, you can have the gifts, but if you don't develop the gifts with hard work, like, you're not going anywhere, bro. Like, I know, I know talented people. My, my brother went to music school, right? And I have watched his, um, his piano, piano teacher play the piano. Nobody can play the piano better than that guy. But it doesn't just take that gift that he has, right? There are a lot of other factors that he has to, you know, put in, in terms of branding. That takes hard work. In terms of how he speaks, how he negotiates for deal, how he prices himself, how he positions himself, how he makes or builds his network. All of that things talent wouldn't give you. So it's a fine blend of, it's a fine blend of both because we, we all know people that, that are talented, but they are basically wasting away in life. So it's a blend of the both. Um, how, I, how I got the optimism, right, is basically from the Bible, right? So growing up, um, my mom always made me go to, what's it called, um, church every Sundays, I think Sundays and Thursdays we have. And there was one particular thing that struck me when they said that, um, um, we, are, we are built in the image of God and in the likeness of God. And God is the ultimate creator. You know, in the Bible, they say God said there was the light and there was light. And I said, let them be light at home. And there was no light. So I was asking, you know, why is there no, why is there no light? So maybe we are made in the image of God and the likeness of God. That means we are gods, right? We are like mini gods. So why can I not do what God can do? You know, but I realized that we can actually do what God can do, but we cannot just say it and it comes to pass. We have to say it and we have to work hard for it. I found Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali always says that he is the greatest, even when he was not the greatest. You know, and the difference between pride and bravado, like I like to call it, pride is just boastful talking. You know, in terms of you're just capping, right? But bravado is Muhammad Ali, where he tells you that I am the greatest, based off what he knows. He knows himself. He knows what he has done. He knows what he is capable of. You are the one that do not know him, and he's telling you, and he is going to show you, in a matter of time, that yes, actually, he is the greatest. Look at Apple. In a world where, in 1987, when Apple was founded. IBM was the biggest computer company in the world, by far. Like, Apple was nowhere to be found, right? But look at a few decades after. Apple is the biggest company in the world. IBM, Apple is like five or six of, of, of these guys today. You know, and this, this, is, this, this is what fuels my optimism, you know, because whatever we want to do in Patricia is not new. It's not new under the sun. As long as we say that we can do it and we're ready to work hard for it and dare to do mighty things and do the most, Apple has done it. You know, Amazon is doing it till today. As a matter of fact, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. Really, and you know, why not? Why not us? Interesting. When I said Patricia, like I had so much experience. Nobody will understand how much experience that they've been able to get. So anything coming my way at that time was not new. Mm. Like I, it's even now that things are new, because now it's a new, different ball game. Three hundred people around the world managing them. I was not. I've never experienced this before, mm. you know. But everything that everything in the first one year, two years, I had either read about read, read about it, or I had experienced it real life myself. You know, mm. so it was it was quite easy navigating so all those the waters. Things, all those things in the past really prepared you for. It was like slumdog millionaire. Yeah. I, I I had literally gone through the motions. I'd gone through the most, you know, from my businesses, the failures. I'd one time I had an indoor spot, right? It was doing very good. I had three locations around the university. It was it was it was nice. Like I think that was my most impressive feat back then in school. I had three locations. Well, we were selling the best Indomie, the best noodles, the best bread. Next thing, the guy I employed broke somebody's head because he was trying to run away with the, with the Indomie. They arrested me. The school shut down my businesses. 
you know, they asked me to choose whether I wanted to go to school or I wanted to sell noodles. They called my parents. It was just so much drama, you know. So, so everything just, you know, built up to the point where I had gained unofficial knowledge. So studying Patricia was like it was I was just bouncing through all the problems as they were coming, you know. And like Steve Jobs always says, you know, you can, you can only connect the dots looking forward, looking backwards, right? So trust the process. Keep doing what you are doing. Because sometimes things do not make sense. Like even today, I've been swamped with too many work, right? But I just keep on pushing, you know, keep on somehow, you know, day by day, nothing changes. But when you look back, nothing was the same. So all those old businesses really prepared you for Patricia. There's nothing yes. like you, nothing was really new to you. Yes, it wasn't new. So and the, on, on, another blessing that, that is a stumbling block for young entrepreneurs today is the fact that there is a tech community. So they want to operate with the laws of tech community. They want to go and raise funds. They want to go and do this. They want to go and seek somebody's advice. I did not do any of that. I did not even know there was a tech community for the first two years of running Patricia. I did not even, like, I did not know any of that. And that was a blessing for me, really, because I had, it was just idea to execution, idea to execution. I did not know that I could actually get money from somebody. If I knew, maybe, I don't know what would have happened, to be honest, you know, but all I knew was this business needed money. We needed 500,000 to make this, that is my next goal. I don't care how we are going to get it, but that is my next goal. And somehow we always, we always got it, you know, we always got it. We just share tenacity, share this is the goal, guys. Let's go. We were literally working 14 hours, 15 hours a, a day. And this is not just me now. The entire team of 40 people. Like if we entered Patricia at that time, right, you will feel fire in the room. I kid you not. You will feel energy. If you are slacking just by the smallest bits, the next person is telling you to stand up. They are taking over from you. Like the energy was... There was no way we were not going to, going to succeed with that kind of energy. Yeah. You already kind of started answering my next question because I wanted to say, you know, confirm first of all that Patricia never raised any money. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, how did you do it? Although you've kind of said how you did it, you just focus, you had your goals. Yeah. But maybe there are some practical um, tips you can give people that are you know, watching this. Yeah. How did you do it without ever raising any money? So the, <laughs> the goal was to make 30k a month, right? One month after Patricia, we had made zero, nothing. I was already frustrated. I, I had like, before Patricia, I had like 800,000. I rented an office with 500,000, a boy's quarter. I called for interviews. I furnished the place with like 100K. I bought secondhand laptops, 30K, 30K. So we were okay. I had like maybe like 120K left, you know. And one month has passed. No business, no nothing. We we're just struggling. Me and my two staffs that I have to pay salary at the end of the month, it was a problem. So for me, it was with every time I tried a business and failed, right? I did not fail, in quotes. I failed forward. I always learned something from it, right? And as I grew in failing, literally, right, I knew that I need to, that even if I fail, I must fail and get some money out of it. I must fail and get some resource. Like there must always be a silver lining. And that's something I live by today. No matter how bad the situation is, I must find a silver lining from anything. It doesn't matter how bad it is. If somebody dies or I waste four hours of my time, I must make sure that before I finish that, that wasting of four hours, I must get something, even if it is a water. A, a glass of water that, that will nourish my body, but I must get something, and that was how we did it. I was able to save 800,000 before I started Patricia, mm -hmm. right? And that was all the money I needed, okay. really. We, like I said, I didn't even know you could raise funds, literally. So that was another blessing. So I didn't even think in that mm -hmm. direction of raising funds. So growing up, right? Um, I also saw that influencers have so much influence, 
celebrities have so much influence. So there was a time in university when Olamide dyed his hair brown. In less than one week, half of my school has dyed their hair brown. And it was mind-boggling for me. You know, only Jesus Christ can make me dye my hair brown. But like half of the school, and I came to Lagos, same thing, you know, and it was just because Olamide dyed his hair brown. So what if Olamide says, use Patricia? I'm pretty sure some people will use Patricia because Olamide says, use Patricia. So now I could not afford Olamide, of course, right? But I could afford Mr. Jolof. Yes, so Mr. Jolof was the first influencer that we paid. So um, I had a mutual friend. I called him up and I said, look, Mr. Jolof, I do, I'm not going to negotiate with you. I don't have money. I have only ATK. Take this ATK and just make this ad for me. Mr. Jolof said, okay, he will make the ad. He made the ad, sent it to me. I hated the ad because he was just on his chair, just relaxed, you know, very casual. Yes. WW dot patricia dot com dot ng what do you mean that they sell gift card that they buy gift card that even they run bitcoin doing self if you will get kept for opta you know understand you want to send a flower and all those kind of doings you know understand to your buyer census go ww dot patricia dot com dot ng you know understand no BOJ this one no BOJ I don't verify this one no BOJ not real matter you know understand www.patricia.com.ng You know, understand? I'm going to follow up. I'm going to promote our guy business if at all. I was so angry. I was like, ah, this guy has finished me. Everything has gone. You know, but he put out the ad the next day, even without telling us in the early morning. And before you know, you know, one inquiry, two inquiries, three inquiries, four, five, one transaction, two transactions, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. He just, he literally just kept on coming. You know, and before the end of the day, we had like 40, 50 transactions, not inquiries now, proper transactions. And I checked and I saw that what we had made 180K in one day. I'm like, what? No, I'm dying here. <laughs> I'm dying here. I took the full 180K. So I, I learned earlier on that whatever works, do it until it stops working. I took the full 180K, paid him again, and paid somebody else. And that was how we just started Patricia. We just started doing and going and going and going. And also, the, the, the business we're in, right, is a fast-moving business. And we were the only ones doing what we were doing in 2017 in the whole of Africa. There was nobody else. At most, there was a Luno. But a Luno was only for the very select few who knows what's up, right? So there was really nobody doing what we were doing for the masses. So Patricia was the first break that people actually saw into crypto, into gift cards. And that was how we were able to... So we, we always made money. Like I said, after one month, we made 180K. So we already had... We were already making money. As a matter of fact, we were making too much money than what I even knew to do with the money. Literally. And... It was also something. It was also the idea of um, the books I read, right? Because I grew up in a family where, at some point, right, my uncles, all of them, I kid you not, right, were the richest people in the area or in the town. They were literally the richest people in the area. Like my family is very popular, right? But. Only a few of them, right, were able to maintain that wealth. And I don't know why they were unable to maintain that wealth, you know? Because growing up, they had the best cars, they had the best lives. Like, I, I brag with my family, you know? But at some point, it just happens that they don't maintain it. And I did not want that to be my, my own case, you know? So I, I read that book. And the book told me that you need to maintain your pulse, right? So if you make one naira from this, put that one naira back into it. Do not spend it. And even from the money you make every day or every week or every month, right? Your personal funds, make sure you save a certain amount. You will not die. That is the truth. Make sure you save. Say you earn 1,000, save 10%, 20%. Make it a standard. You, you and yourself will find a way to adjust 
with that 80% that you have left. And that was how I was able to save money for all my businesses, for my monthly allowance, from the small, small things I did in school to make money at every point in time. So with Patricia, it was very easy because I had already built that saving, that saving bone in me. And what did I do? I put all the money we made for almost 14, 15 months in crypto, mm. in Bitcoin. Mm. Bear in mind, Bitcoin was $3,000 at, yes. at the time. I still have Bitcoin from that time mm. till now. Okay. And Bitcoin now is $47,000. Mm. So I, had, I have made like times 100, times 100 okay. literally. Mm -hmm. 100 is even small. But I had made a whole lot of money from just that investment I did in 2018, 2017. So it's just that idea of, you know, doubling down and doing it. So I really did not need to raise funds because oh, we, did, we never lacked funds, right? Because there was always money available. Patricia was profitable, investments were good, we were diversifying. Everything was just like, you know, it was just, you know, you know what they say, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. Holding on the thought of that when the time has come, I will go back to that. But I want to first quickly ask, would you, if you offered VC money today, would you take it? Well, to whoever is watching this video, right, we need $50 million. <laughs> Just $50 million? <laughs> Only. Okay. Only. I hope you put that listening. <laughs> Only. We need $50 million. So right now we're looking at um, global expansion. Okay. Right, global expansion. Um, and that's the next forty for us, you know. So we are not actively raising funds, but I've done the math in my head. Mm. I've known the numbers. I've crunched. I've crunched the numbers for us to be a proper international global company. You know, fifty million dollars would be a very good start for a Series A if we were to raise funds. Okay, I hope people are listening. How did you discover crypto, though? Especially at that early time. Right? So it was my customers, right? Mm. The, the people we had in Patricia, the users, that introduced me to crypto. Oh, so it was not crypto? No, it was gift cards. Oh, it was just gift cards? Yes. So they're helping people get like Apple gift cards yes. and whatnot? Yes, perfect. How, okay, how did that work? So I would, I would basically, so the idea came from, so how I generate ideas is I don't try to do too much, really. Like generally, I have, a, I have many principles I live by, right? And, and one of them is Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor basically says that sometimes, and most times, 90% of the time, from my own experience, the best solution is usually the simplest solution. But people like to overthink things. They like to drag it. The first idea that comes to my head, I implement that one first, where we try and look for a better plan. And I've saved almost two weeks of planning, and we're already somewhere we need to be, and we just keep on beating on, on top of that one. So, my uncle sent me a gift card. One of my uncles in London. And I'm like, I asked you for money, you're sending me a gift card. What do I do with this gift card now? You know, I checked everywhere in the full world. There was nowhere to change this gift card to cash. I went to one platform. They scammed me. Funny thing is, I met with, funny thing is, how this word is funny is, I met with the CEO of that platform just yesterday, really. And he didn't know that he was the one that inspired me for Patricia. That's fine. If he did not scam me on his platform, I would never have thought about Patricia. So they scammed me. And I was like, wow. So he hurt me that I lost the money, right? But he also informed me that if they scammed me, it means that somebody somewhere too would have the same problem and they will scam him. Because there is no place to do this thing that I have found and I have searched. And that was it. Just like that. that was it, yeah. So did you have to you code, did you have to code up something or was it just So I had this idea in twenty fifteen. I wrote it down. In twenty seventeen I executed. So I have zero technical background. So that's what I'm saying. Like you don't need to you don't need to have it all figured out. Right, even till now, I don't have it all figured out. I, I go with the principle of um, put your best foot forward. Go as far as you can. When you reach that point, you will see further and go again. When you reach that point, you will see further 
and go again. So it's the it's the shifting goalpost that never really that never really ends. You know, there's a saying that goes like um um build your ship while you sail. And that's exactly what I did. We built Patricia off WhatsApp. Well, Literally. Was it was so difficult, but it was so much fun. So it was not as as a thing, right? We didn't even see it as stress, right? We were, we, were, we were doing mighty things on WhatsApp, right? We made so many mistakes. I think one of, one of the biggest mistakes we made was to take the business to Instagram because we felt that we'll be able to reach more users because Instagram can have multiple people logged in at the same time. So you can have more agents logged on to, to customers, worst move ever. We lost so many customers, scam pages that are coming up, you know, problems here, there, blah, it was so much work. Our page got shut down like four times on Instagram. And that was like the worst thing to ever happen to us. Like at that point, we felt like the place was over. But somehow we just found ways to keep, you know. So yeah. So how did you go about hiring your, your first set of uh, people that joined you? Like yeah. employee number one? Employee number one was, I went to the office and uh, my brother was, is, is a musician. So he has a manager, Bemi. So I told Bemi, look, Bemi, this is what I want to do. So we're like, okay, it's fine. Um, and he put our word on Twitter. Interview date for Wednesday, I think. And people showed up. I was like, wow, they really showed up. Interesting. Like, I think five people showed up, right? We, we hired two persons, Chris and Beauty. So Chris, which was the first employee in quotes, right? Is now the CEO of Patricia. CEO, nice. yeah, and he's second in command, and he's still with us. Nice. So yeah, um, yeah. So how how did you know over the years? What did you learn about managing people as you kept hiring? Now you say you have like three hundred people. Yeah. In Patricia and Lewis. Yeah. What have you learned? Man, first thing is trust your gut, really, because I can tell you stories about how I met my key executives, right? I am. Um, I, I think I, I have a very good gut, really. Far more than anything, I have a very good gut. I met my chief of people in the bank, right? And I went to the bank one day to open a, a bank account for Patricia. That's like four months into Patricia now. And I, and I entered the bank and I saw this lady at the cashier's desk, the front office desk. I just knew to speak to her. Like I just knew that she was the one I needed to speak to, right? So I waited for her to be free. There were, there were lots of people there, but I waited for her to be free. She got free, I sat down, I got there by 10. I sat down and we started talking. Me and this lady, we spoke from 10 o'clock to six in the evening. We, we lost track of time. We were just talking, talking. The manager had to come and pursue me from the bank. Literally had to send me away. Because I was one scrawny team boy with short knicker, dreads, scatter, just looking anyhow, Shaq. But our conversation meant a lot to me because the first thing I told her when I sat down was, wow, I love your bank. It's so big. Like I, was just, like, I, I was literally just sharing my honest thoughts about how I just loved how big the bank was. There are people working. Like this was my dream, to have an establishment this big. Bear in mind that we were in a boy's quarter. Okay. Yes. And the first thing this lady told me was, I should not worry. I will have it. And there, it was how she said it. You know, it's kind of like when you come back from school and you come back with your, with your, with your bag, your uniform, you have finished playing, your shirts are on top, they're just, you know, having a good time. And you come home and you ask your mom, Mommy, is there food? And she says, Your food is in the kitchen. Now, you don't go and check if your food in the kitchen, no. You drop your bag and you go and eat. You know that for sure your food is in the kitchen. That was how she told me that I would have it. Like that, was the, that was how I felt when she told me that. And at that point, I just thought that, look, you're working in the bank now, but I will employ you. She told me I should get out. <laughs> I should get out, blah, 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 blah. So we, we shall kept in touch, you know. A few months later, called her. Now we moved from the voice quarter to a duplex. So, a yes, just like so. It's a very funny story, this particular story, right? 
we started by August. So December, right, is December. BT had already left before December, so it was just me and Chris. But December now, Chris had to go for like holidays and all of that. And it was so much work for only me to handle. And I was just there to just pinch Chris that I found out. Stay now. I'll give, you, I'll give you more money now. Stay now. I said, no, he had to go. I said, okay, it's fine. You should go. This was the defining moment for Patricia. That's December. So I went. You know how you watch movies of um, entrepreneurs when they are obsessed mm -hmm. with their business? That was my obsession phase, right? I had no December. I had no January, no Christmas, no holiday. I literally worked from... 5th of December till February 20th or so, when Chris came back. He was meant, he was meant to come back by December, January 15th, but he didn't. I, didn't even, I even lost track that he was supposed to come back. I worked every single day from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock. I was just doing it. 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 And it didn't even feel like work. I didn't even feel like I was missing out on anything. Like... I was just in that, in that laser focus. I wish I can experience that feeling again. Now there are too many distractions. But I was just in that, in that zone. So Chris came back February 20th. And it was just still me in the office, right? So he, he started picking up the slack. And Chris is very clinical. He's very proper. He's the opposite of me. I have dreads, I'm gangster. Jaga Jaga, scattered, Chris is, he is tucked in, sharp, his hair is sharp, carved, low cuts. That's how he has always been. He came back, he looked at our books on finances, and Patricia had made 3.5 million in profits, right, by the end of these two months. I did not even know we had made that money. I didn't, keeping which keeping which records. I was just doing my thing. I was just cause yes, is it done? Yes, yes, is it done? Yes, is it done? But yes. yes. No, no, no system. It was WhatsApp. <laughs> I did not even know what we were doing. All I just knew was that I wake up in the morning, right? I will answer all the customers till eleven o'clock. Attend to all their trades, their transactions. Give them good service. That was all. I did not know about the numbers. I did not know if we were making profits. I just knew that the money was shy increasing. But I didn't even know the amount of money that was, yeah, that was not my business. Like, so this thing is a hobby for me. Even if I was not paid to do it, I would still do it. It's like playing football for like footballers. I would still do it for free. Like if I was a musician, I would still come and work in a company just for like internship or just for vibes. I would still, so I was just doing it because it made me genuinely happy. So when Chris came back, ah, ah, see block. I told my brother, I said it's a lie. I should get out. I showed him the money. We literally made 3.5 million. I was like, okay, good, fantastic, 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 fantastic. What do we do with this money? That was the next question. I took this money and I rented a five-bedroom duplex. Just like that. Yes. When I did that, they called the family meeting on top of my head. <laughs> Literally. Chris thought I was crazy. My brother just gave me a chance. He's, he, my brother is always, is that what you want to do? Yes. All right. Do it. I'll support you. My family thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy. But that's the thing about vision. You know, people don't really see what you see. You know, they don't, really, they don't like, nobody can really understand this vision thing. You know, it's, it's like when Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. But he went and made the first combustion engine, and that changed the world forever. You know, in, in a world where, where everybody was using styluses to make um, tablets and phones, Steve Jobs says, why are, we, why are we using one stylus when we have five fingers? You know, so I understood all of these things at that time. So I was not even going to argue with anybody or going to try and convince you of what I'm trying to do. So I went to the five bedroom duplex, now we're broke. What do we do now? So my family came and said, okay, why don't you rent some of these spaces as co-working hubs so you can make some money? It was a good idea, right? But I knew that it would hamper my vision because I needed to fill that office up 
and fill it up with the right people, not just fill it up because we can fill it up, you know? And I said no. And they came back again that they will not give me any money, they will not help me, that I can make money from that place. I'm not doing it, I'm just being wasteful. I'm like, okay, it's fine, I'll figure it out. I know Patricia will make that money in another one month or two months. And we kept on working again. Yeah, so we kept on working again. So now it was me and Chris and two guys that we've employed, four people in the company. It's time to expand. We started, we started having interviews, but when, when they come to the interview session, right, they will see me, right, they will run away. <laughs> because I'm just standing with my short knickers, slippers, just dressed anyhow, right, and in a big, uncompleted building. Nobody wants to enter that building because they think it's ritualist or something. So we changed tactic, right? Chris will be the one downstairs. So when they see Chris, they would want to fear, but Chris looks presentable. They will take Chris, right? And that was how we were able to employ a couple of people. Some of them are still with us still today. Interesting. You know, but the problem was even Chris was not cutting it, right? Chris was not cutting it. That was where Chica came in from the bank. So I called Chica up and said, come and see what we've done. She came, she saw it, she was blown away. That day, she quit her job at the bank. Oh. I think she was earning like 120K. I paid her 40K a month. She skilled well. Yes, she did. She came as head of people. Which head of people? <laughs> <laughs> she came as Patricia. Just, <laughs> just come. The just the come. <laughs> Anyhow, that's the thing. Like Everybody just came because we did not know what job titles were. We did not, that, that was what made it beautiful. Like, you know, right now, I see that there are courses for what we did back then. Like, it was a flat structure. There was no boss. There was no, and even till now, there really is a boss, you know? But there was nothing. So when you come in, just come and find a need. Just come and find a need. So one person can be HR, can be brand manager, can be social media manager, can be in payments, can be, you know, the roads were just switching very fast. We slept in the office, we walked in the office, we woke up in the office. It was just madness, but it was the best time. Okay, we, we live in a very uh, ageist society. Yeah. Like, let's put it that way. And you're young. Yeah. Older guy, you're less than 50. Yeah. I'm sure many people that work for you are older than you. Did they ever come up that they like, what is the small brain? A lot, a lot. So how did you... So I had, to, I had to deal with a lot of things that people don't really get to understand. You know, but I learned this lesson earlier on in university. So, um, in school, right, I was, I was bright, you know. I was quite popular because I made, I got one of the best grades in year one. So they brought me out, they gave me awards, so people knew me in school. But I wasn't getting respected. I was getting bullied a lot. And in Portacourt, courtism is high. So every other week, they are collecting my phone, they are collecting something from me, you know, they just, they just, they just, just, you know. So I realized something, that all the boys, all the courtes, right, are on dreads, are on dread, and nobody used to touch them, <laughs> right? If, 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 if I'm walking on the streets and somebody else is walking on the streets, and that person is on dread, they will stop me. They will not stop that person. So I went on dread. And that, was, and that was it. Literally. I never had any issue anymore in school. Just because I was now on dread. I was seen as if I was one of those bad guys. So when you see me, I don't talk to him more. Because I was big. So you don't know who he is or what, he, what he's about. So everybody just gave me space. So I was always very observant. You know, but when it came to Patricia, I understood that. So Chris, Chris will call me boss. Chica will call me boss, right? But the new recruits will not call me boss. Some of them will call me Hanu, or they will just try to avoid calling me at all, right? They will just say something else, but they will just mask it, you know, in a way that I know what they're trying to do. So I realized that there was no point of me trying to demand their respect. Because it's basically a game of respect. The reason why Chris is calling me boss, so Chris is just a different, different human being, to be honest. Because from the very first day he came, he started calling me boss. 
right? But for the other people in Patricia, there is always a tipping point. Some of them call me boss because they have self-respect and they understand that, okay, if Chris calls me boss, they should call me boss. But some are just stubborn, right? So I realized that there's, or there was the tipping point, right? And the tipping point was when I earned their respect by doing something fantastic or solving their problem or doing something that they did not know I could do or proving myself as I am worthy of being their boss. So it was a challenge for me, right, to actually earn my staff's respect. And I did it. Because it's a business, right? They will always come to you for problems. So how I handled their problems, how I solved the problems, showed that I was wise beyond my age. It's not because I'm a 21-year-old, right? It, like they realized why I was the one sitting on that table. I was the one, like they realized why I needed to be called that title. So now it's easy. Even, even pff, other CEOs call me boss now. So now it's not even a thing of, you know, but back then, it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was trouble. It was a big problem. And at some point, I needed to show strength, right? I, I literally had, had people on the spot. So, no, then it was, it was a lot to deal with, but we figured out a way to handle it. Are they any regrets? Even higher regrets, no? Of course, they are, but I wouldn't really say it's a regret because, like I said, you can't really connect the dots, yeah. you know, so, yeah. I think I have two more questions. So let's talk about the crypto ban. Yeah. How did they affect Patricia? I noticed that you guys have moved your headquarters to Estonia. Yeah. And then Richard was just telling me now that it's other other things about around the Patricia you just want to what to sit here now, no yeah. more Patricia. Yeah. So just tell me about the how so did the ban the, I, the idea there was um the ban happened, you know, basically we're not welcome in Nigeria anymore, at least for the meantime. And business has to go on. The amount of feed, you know, I wouldn't just lay off my staff just because CBN says that we can't do business anymore. You know, even if that wasn't thoughtful on their parts, it's my responsibility to make sure that patricians are safe. They have job security. They understand that their welfare and their well-being is our priority, regardless of what the economic realities are in the country. So we needed to get a crypto license and expand past the shores of Africa. Because Africa, Nigeria is at the, at the base of things today, still a very small pie in the concept of the world and crypto. You know, the biggest crypto players in the world, say Coinbase, worth over 100 billion, they have no footprints in Africa. Yeah. In Africa, not Nigeria. Yeah. So it means that there's more out there than there is, is in here. Right, so that was why we moved to Estonia, got a license, and um, we, we now have operations in 27 EU countries. We just want soup. So it was a setback for something greater. So you pushed you guys to, okay. to think beyond. So we're going to do that at some point, yeah. but not just this year. What advice do you have for any young person in school right now? Yeah. They have that fire like you. So they want to be entrepreneur. What would you advise them based on what you've yeah. experienced over the years? Have a journal. First thing first, write your ideas down. That's very easy because. If I never wrote Patricia down, I would never have something to look back to, right? So have a journal, have something, you know, write, write your ideas down, read a lot of books, not your school books now, right? Read a lot of whatever your interests are, right? Delve in, get a lot of books, and try a lot of things. You have time, you can fail, literally. You know, most people don't even try because they're afraid of failing. And this is many people I speak to every single day. They don't even try because they feel like you know, they just come up with excuses in their head as to why this, why that. But I'll tell you something. The only thing that we have all tried over a thousand times, every single person in the world, right, is how to walk. You are walking today. You were a baby. Nobody taught you how to walk. You taught yourself how to walk. You fell down, you stood up, you crawled, and you continued walking. Shame. If you had people telling you that, oh, see, you are too fat, see your legs, you cannot walk, maybe you would stop trying. But as a kid, you never knew what they were saying. You were just trying to walk. So 13 businesses, trust me, if I, if I had to try 100 businesses, I would have tried because I also read that Michael Faraday tried the light bulb a thousand times. 
Thomas Edison, yeah. So I don't even know if it's true or not, or it's just capping, right? <laughs> but if anybody can try something a thousand times, ah, you must succeed. Trust me. If you don't succeed, right, you will find penicillin. What is now the maybe? What is the the plan? What is the vision three years, five years down the line for Patricia? So our plan is to make crypto easier. That's what we're going to do. But now, for the world, right? So. There is a fifth revolution coming. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. So we've, we've always had revolutions around the world. You know, the coal revolution, industrial revolution, revolution when they, um, they made the engines, that was another revolution. The internet was another revolution, you know, the fourth revolution. But we have the fifth revolution coming. But the thing about these revolutions are they don't announce when they come, right? They are, it's almost either it's, all, it's almost over before they say, oh, that was the fifth revolution. That was the first revolution. So everything has evolved in this world, right, except money. Only money has not evolved. And money is evolving now, right? And that's why there's so much pushback, you know? And when these things come, there's always a battle. Henry Ford, horses or combustion engine, there was a very big battle. You know, the internet, dot com, the dot-com crash, everybody was like, I told you, it's bad now, right? But if you look at it, everybody in the fourth revolution are the billionaires today. Amazon, PayPal, eBay. They were all made in the 1990s, 1999, 2000s. That was when this company started in the fourth revolution. Now, the fifth revolution is here, and it's the evolution of money. And that is... That is where we want to be at. So in the next five years, in the next 10 years, Patricia will be at the Apple, the Amazon, the eBay of the world in cryptocurrency. So thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to the, the fifth revolution we're in. And then five years, 10 years down the line, when Patricia, when Hammy is one of the billionaires of the revolution, I'll say her name. <laughs> but thanks so much for your it's inspiring stories. It's wonderful to see your journey. And it's very, it's very clear that you know, your, your, what you did in the past really helped you, and uh, yeah. we'll be watching, and uh, yeah, we'll see for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, <laughs> Chief.